redeemed. I'm redeemed. Thank you so much for leading us in song this morning, Jake. And welcome to all of you, uh, member, non-member, uh, visitor and guest. If you are visiting with us, then we want to welcome you this morning. Uh, we ask that you take one of those cards that you see in front of you and uh, fill that out, and then you can put it in the box in the back, or uh, you can text the number that's been on the PowerPoint screen and do the same thing there. That's just so we can get to know you and you can get to know us, and we can express our appreciation for you being here this morning. There have been many people throughout history that have died for causes that they sincerely believed in. We could look at example after example of martyrs for their faith, example after example of people who gave their lives for things that they sincerely and truly believed in. Just a few examples. On June 11th, 1963, there was a Buddhist monk that burned himself alive on the streets of Saigon in Vietnam to protest the persecution of Buddhists by the South Vietnamese government. We know that in 1993, 76 people died at the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, because they believed in their leader, David Koresh. He, they believed that he was a prophet from God. And we all know that on September 11, 2001, four planes were hijacked by devout Muslims, believing that their actions were pleasing to God, and they almost killed, they killed themselves and almost three thousand people. All of these people died for causes that they believed, that they sincerely and genuinely believed were true. The Buddhist monk, all of the followers of David Koresh, all of those that flew themselves into the Twin Towers, into the Pentagon, and into a field in Pennsylvania, killing themselves and other people, they believed sincerely that what they were doing was the truth. That, what the, that the cause that they were dying for was genuine. That, they, that what they were dying for was the truth. But history fails to give us a true example of an individual or a group of people who would die knowing that what they died for was a lie. This morning, I want to discuss a key piece of evidence as we continue our series on talking about our living faith, a key piece of evidence which gives extraordinary, I believe, credibility to the claim that the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ was a historical event. My brothers and sisters this morning, you can know, you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt, you can know for certain that the faith you hold and cherish so very dearly is not a lie, it's not a myth, it's not a legend, it's living and it's active because we know that Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. Well, as we've looked at so far within this series, we have established the fact that Christianity is based upon an event. And that event is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not occur, then Paul says we are still in our sins. And the faith that we hold so dear, it's in vain. It means absolutely nothing. Our faith hinders upon the historical reliability of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we looked at a couple weeks ago, we saw that the accounts, the New Testament, that contain information about the resurrection... They're not myths, they're not legends, they're not stories that have been developed over centuries that have been fabricated and, 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 mold, and, and evolved into the, the form that we see today. They're in fact reliable sources. They're not myths and they're not legends. So this means, and this is the direction that we're going to go in this morning, this means factually that the 12 disciples we read about in the New Testament, the 12 disciples of Jesus are real people that claimed Jesus had risen. And this is the claim that I am going to be making this morning and going to be arguing uh, in, 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 in favor of our living faith this morning, that the lives and deaths 
of these 12 men and others, the lives and the deaths of the early followers of Jesus testify that he certainly rose from the grave. That's what we're going to be diving into briefly this morning. So we're going to look at three facts, three facts about those that claim Jesus rose from the grave rose from the grave. Turn with me to John chapter 20, verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. The first fact concerning those 12 disciples that claim Jesus rose from the grave is that they were discouraged. They were very discouraged immediately after the death of Jesus Christ. It says this in John chapter 20, verse 19. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Now, when their Lord was crucified, when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross in, in, sight of, in public sight of all to witness, it did not embolden the disciples to begin a new movement. It did not cause them to be passionate about spreading the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. It rather consumed them with fear because they believed the authorities were, were going to come after them next. They were traumatized by the death of Jesus. They weren't emboldened. They didn't have passion to pursue the cause of Christ. They were ready to give it all up. And that brings us to the next point. They thought that when Jesus died, these 12 men... They thought that when their leader that they had been following around for several years, that when he died, it was all over. It was all over. Everything that they had given their lives for for the past several years was done, was ended, was completed. And that they were possibly going to be martyred and killed next. In Mark chapter 14, verse 60, 46 through 50, it says, And they laid hands on him. This is Jesus in the garden. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against, have you come out as against a robber with swords, with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And then, and then it says this concerning Jesus' disciples. And they all left him and fled. When Jesus was captured and led away to die, they believed that everything they worked so hard for during the past several years was all a waste. They were no longer passionate followers of Christ, but they were rebels on the run from an angry mob. In John chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus says this concerning his disciples. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you, Jesus says to his disciples, I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. The disciples didn't just have a student teacher, a master teacher relationship with Jesus. The disciples had a sincere, endearing friendship with Jesus. They, they loved each other so very much. Just imagine, just imagine what it would be like if one of your friends was murdered. One of your friends was, uh, was killed in front of your face. Would that embolden you and give you passion to start a movement and to preach His message? No, that would bring you complete discouragement. They thought that when Jesus died, it was all over. They had no motivation the Bible says, to continue the mission of their dead Messiah. We see this in Luke 24, verses 10 through 11. It says, Now it was Mary Magdalene, after Jesus had claimed to have been risen. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and, the, and, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, it says. Speaking of the disciples, they, they, they thought it was foolishness. They thought it was silly that someone would actually rise bodily after they had been pronounced dead for several days. And it says, and they did not believe them. When they were first told about the empty tomb, they didn't believe it. They were down and depressed, rather, because of their defeated the Messiah. They were not willing to begin 
a new movement. They had no motivation, no passion, no spirit to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. They were completely and utterly discouraged after the death of Jesus. That's the first fact that I want to look at this morning, which leads us into the second fact that we read about in the reliable New Testament. All of the twelve disciples, even though they were discouraged immediately after after the death of Jesus, a very short time after Jesus' claims to have been risen, a very short time after the death and resurrection of Jesus, they suddenly became courageous. They suddenly were emboldened and and lived with passion and zeal to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. The disciples' demeanor suddenly and drastically changed. They did a 180 in their demeanor. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, Peter, in his, uh, in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, just, just a few days, just, just, a, a, just a relatively short time after Jesus had claimed to, to have been risen, he says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, Peter says, publicly in front of people that killed Jesus and could have killed him as well. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. We see within Scripture, within a very short time of Jesus' death and the disciples' former discouragement, they became emboldened and inspired to continue the mission of Jesus and preach His gospel to the ends of the earth. Imagine with me. Think about this. Imagine with me for a moment that two people walk into a cave and one of them says, I don't believe that there's any bears in this cave. They, he's, he doesn't have any fear. He doesn't possess any, any fear whatsoever that, that a bear could be lurking in the darkness. But then he goes in front of his friend. He ventures out into the cave. And then all of a sudden, the man that stayed behind hears a scream. And the man that went on ahead of him comes running back with his face, with, with his face, his face as white as a ghost and his face full of fear. And, and, he, and, and, and the this, this sudden change, the sudden change in his demeanor um, is evidence, of course, that he saw something. It is evidence that there may be a, actually a bear in the cave. A sudden and sudden and drastic change in his, his, in his persona, in his demeanor, gives evidence that he saw and witnessed something. It's the same way here. In Acts chapter 5, verse 40 through 42, it says... And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that the Christ is Jesus. We see from the pages of Scripture that the authorities arrested the followers of Christ and beat them. But they were soon back out on the streets preaching Jesus, not afraid of death, not afraid of being beaten because they saw something. Their demeanor drastically changed after their claim to have seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We see The example of the Apostle Paul, a very similar example. The Apostle Paul, he suddenly and drastically changed after claiming to have had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. All of us know that the Apostle Paul, formerly Saul, was a persecutor of the church. He didn't believe in the empty tomb. He certainly heard accounts that Jesus had risen. He didn't believe it for one minute. He thought they were falsified claims. The Apostle Paul, the Saul, did not believe that the disciples, uh, he didn't believe the disciples' claims to see Jesus after he rose. 
He believed that Jesus' death on the cross disqualified him from being the Messiah. Under his Jewish worldview, a dead Messiah cannot be the Messiah. Cursed is everybody who hangs. Cursed is the one who hangs upon a tree. In Paul's mind, formerly Saul, Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah. Somewhat, he also believed that someone being resurrected from the dead before the end of the age was absurd according to his theological worldview. And he believed to worship Jesus as God was a damnable heresy in the eyes of God. And it's amazing how sudden and drastic the Apostle Paul's demeanor changed. Paul's character radically transformed when he came to know Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 through 14, it, he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's amazing that immediately after Paul's conversion, he became the picture of humility. He says to the Philippian church, count other people more significant than yourself. Formerly he, was an in, he, formerly he was intolerant. He was bitter. He was a persecutor. He was a religious bigot. He was proud and temperamental. And he stored up this, this overwhelming hatred inside of his heart. And that all changed when he claimed to have an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did that change, but Paul's relationship with the followers of Jesus transformed. In Acts chapter 9, verse 27 and 28, it says, But Barnabas took him, that being Paul, and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. They were no longer afraid of Paul after he had this conversion experience. He immediately embraced the disciples of Jesus and all of those who embraced Jesus had risen from the grave and embraced this new sect. He immediately embraced them as part of his own spiritual family. How amazing! Someone who was the epitome of an antagonist against the faith becomes one of its greatest proponents. Paul's message was transformed drastically in, 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 a, in, in a short amount of time. Galatians chapter 2, 20, verse 20 says, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul's mission was transformed. Paul's message and, 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 and his entire way of life was completely transformed drastically and suddenly after having a, a, an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.20 it says, Therefore, Paul says of himself, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. He says, we implore you, a man that once killed Christians and possessed hatred in his heart. He implores people on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. The Apostle Paul suddenly and drastically changed after he had a spiritual encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Not only the Apostle Paul, but what about James, the brother of Jesus? James, uh, the, the writer of the book of James, was the, was, was the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. And like Paul, he suddenly and drastically changed after claiming Jesus' resurrection. James, Jesus' own brother, did not believe in Jesus' claim to be God while he was alive on his earthly, during his earthly ministry. In John chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, it says, So his brother said to him, that being James, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing there. For no one works in secret if he, if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, then show yourself to the world. 
For, for, for not even his brothers believed in him, the text says. In other words, here's another way that you could say this. Why don't you go up to Jerusalem, Jesus, and put on a big show with all of your miracles and with all of your healings? In a sarcastic tone. James, the brother of Jesus, was a skeptic. He did not believe in his brother's claims to be God. Just imagine if, if, if the one that you grew up with, if your brother went around claiming, made, made wild claims, uh, saying that I am the vine and you are the branches. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. Just imagine the one that you grew up with, your own brother, went around making uh, audacious and crazy claims such as those. Imagine how you would think and how you would feel. James must have been humiliated by his brother Jesus, by how, by how he was going around making these wild and radical claims about him being the Son of Man, him being God in human flesh. But we know from Scripture that James, even though he was a skeptic, even though he didn't believe his brother, he suddenly and drastically changed after having an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, Paul says, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In James chapter 1, verse 1, James himself, he says, James, a servant. Or you could also translate that, you could also translate that word slave. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James says that he is a slave to his brother Jesus. What would turn this scoffer, this skeptic, into a man who would be willing to die for his brother's deity? You decide. I'm going to look at a final fact this morning as we close. All of the disciples, Paul included, and James, they were willing to suffer and die, to be martyrs for their claims, for the claim that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. In John chapter 21, verse 18 through 19, Jesus, predicting Peter's death, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And then it says, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Church history tells us that Peter was crucified. Church history tells us that he was more than likely crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord Jesus. Andrew was also crucified James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by the sword. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew was crucified. Thomas was killed by a spear. Matthew was killed by the sword. James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified. Thaddeus was killed by arrows. Simon the Zealot was also crucified. What made them willing to die? What made them willing to suffer and be tortured and die? After being discouraged, after being skeptical, after not believing that Jesus had risen from the grave, what would make them be willing to die and give their life for this faith? Not only the, apostle, not only the twelve, but also the Apostle Paul suffered and died at the hands of persecutors because he refused to renounce his claims to have witnessed the resurrected Jesus. You can go and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and see all of the ways in which Paul suffered for the faith. Not one of us has experienced what Paul has, the sufferings and the persecutions for, the, for his faith. He was willing to be abused he was willing to be mistreated and martyred because of his love for Jesus Christ. He didn't renounce his claim even while being killed. Church tradition tells us that Paul was beheaded because of his faith in Rome. And all he had to do to stop all of that, to stop the persecution, to stop his execution, was to renounce his claim that Jesus had risen from the grave, but he never did. James, likewise, the brother of Jesus, died at the hands of persecutors because he refused to renounce 
his claims to have witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see from church tradition, it tells us that James was stoned to death by order of the high priest. Now, in view of these three facts, I want to ask this question. And I, I studied this argument when I was in college, and it was very, very convincing to me. And, and, and it gave me much passion to be who Jesus wants me to be and, and, and to keep pursuing my faith and to grow deeper. I want all of us to honestly ask this question. Who would willingly die for what they know is a lie? The apostles claim to have seen Jesus after he rose from the grave. If those claims were false, if Jesus did not rise from the grave, if the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a hoax, the disciples, more than anyone else, would have known about it. They would have known that it was a hoax if it happened to be so. Matthew would have known that Jesus really didn't appear out of thin air in the upper room after he had died. Thomas would have known that he didn't really place his hands over Jesus' scars. Peter would have known that Jesus didn't really tell him to feed his sheep after the resurrection. John would have known he, that if he, didn't, if, if he didn't really see Jesus ascend into heaven, Paul would have known if Jesus really didn't appear to him on the Damascus road. And James, the Lord's brother, would have known if he really never saw his resurrected brother, <coughs> Jesus. Yet, almost every one of them, with the exception of John, the son of, son of Zebedee, almost every one of them was tortured and brutally murdered for their belief. Brothers and sisters, there have been many people throughout history. Many people die for what they believe in. The Buddhist monk, the 9-11 attackers, the 76 in Waco, Texas, the list could go on and on and on about people who have given their lives for causes that they believed were true. But no one, no one willingly suffers and dies for what they know isn't true. I believe that Jesus has given this to us that we can have confidence that He's there. Our faith is not dead. Our faith is not a myth. Our faith is not a legend. Our faith is living and it's active. God is, God is real. God is alive. God is working through providence in this world to bring about His glory and man's ultimate joy. God is alive and He is working. The best way to explain all of this eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus is that it is the truth. My message to you, my brothers and sisters, this morning is that you can have confidence that your faith, the faith that you hold so dearly, is nothing but the truth. And what a blessing, what a rich blessing it is that God has given us this evidence that we can search out for ourselves and know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you have any need this morning, if you uh, do not believe and you have been persuaded, you have uh, believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you've repented of your sins, come forward and confess faith in Him. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Or if you are hurting in some way, um, if you need prayers from the church, and you would like for us to bear your burdens, please let that be known. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.